A very good morning to all of you. I'm very happy to be here since two days listening several talks and learned also many things. I'm grateful to Michelle and Professor Prabhakaran for inviting me here. So uh, as you learned from Pangarat sir, that uh, the Indian population is not only mixed with many other population, but they also have very unique profile, which is present in each and every individual and each one of us represent the information about our caste. So this is mainly focused towards a particular question which is uh, hanging since 150 years, the colonial time, where it has been shown that some people living at the Chota Nagpur region called as a tribal, they call them as Mool Nivasi, they call them as Adivasi. So this Adivasi population, we look with the genetic data whether they are really Adivasi, they are the first person who came to India from Africa or, or people who are living uh, in other parts of India, how do they, do they have this kind of ancestry? So overall Indian population at the moment is divided into four major language groups, Indo-European language group is most of the part, whereas Dravidian restricted to southern part of India and then at the Himalayan fringes, tibeto burmans and Austroasiatics, they are present at the pockets. There are few linguistic isolates and then Indian population is divided into many other parts. So overall, if we look to the human body, there are 37.2 trillion cells. This human body has a nucleus present in each and every cell. This nucleus has 1 to 22 pairs of chromosome. We analyze those 1 to 22 pair of chromosome. There is also, as, I, as, as Sir said, that there is a powerhouse that is called mitochondria. Mitochondria has mitochondrial DNA, which is exclusively being in inherited by mother. So if one has to study the mitochondrial DNA, look to this, uh, only we would be able to know the ancestry of our grandmother. So, and to, towards the maternal grandmother. If one just study the Y chromosome, you would get the information about the paternal grandfather. So this father, grandfather, and then so on in the previous generation. But what about these people? So these people are completely missing. So one has to study the 1 to 22 chromosome, which is present in our nucleus. And 1 to 22 chromosome gives the information about all our ancestors. But there is not a straightforward migration Migration means the chromosome movement from one generation to another generation for this one to 22 chromosome. They half of, they all the time reduces half in each and every generation. For example, like from our mother, we get 50%. From our father, we get 50%. In great grandmother, great grandfather, this 50% goes up like each and every generation mathematically. So there are, few studies which were indeed supporting that the Austroasiatic people living at the Chota Nagpur region, they are the first settlers of India. There were initial studies, they have been on, they have been done on mitochondrial DNA, they have been done on Y chromosomes, and all of them consistently they were supporting that the Austroasiatic people, they are the first people, they are the first people who came to India from Africa 65,000 years ago, and they are the first settler of India, rest of the people, they came later. And when Sir has published this ANI paper in Nature, there was a commentary from Aravinda Chakravarti, he's very well known human geneticist, and without any reference, he just used very straightforward, similarly as we see that, that uh, sun comes from east and goes to the west, so there is no need of references, and he, straightforward use that the earliest occupation of subcontinent was by Austroasiatic people 60,000, then Dravidian came around 3000 BC, and then Aryan came 1500 BC. So this was the notion up to 2009, 2010, or every, everyone has accepted that this is the correct theory from the colonial time. 
So, and this theory was also shown that once upon a time, the Paramunda language that is a part of Austroasiatic that has been spoken by the people living at Indus Valley, by people living at Gangetic Plain. So everywhere, once upon a time, the first people who came out of Africa 65,000 years ago, they have been once upon a time all over, the, all over the India, including the Indus Valley, and they were speaking Austroasiatic language. Some genetic study, as well as Professor Michael Bidgel, they all has accepted it, and the theory went on. The genetic study based on YSTR showed that there is a haplogroup called haplogroup O2A, and they have used some, they have used some uh, uh, specific techniques. There they showed that the TMRCA, the time for most recent common ancestor for this lineage is 65,000 years older. And haplogroup M2, which is one of the most ancient Indian haplogroup present into Indian population, it is also present in a 20% frequency of Austroasiatic speaker. That's why they are most ancient settler. But there were problem in identification. They misidentified East Asian lineage as M2. And then also the O2A dating was also complicated. Why? We have used their data compared with our data. And we found out that they, there were some unusual interhaplogroup distances with the YSTRs. There were some YSTRs which were also showing very unusual distribution and that's why they got a very wrong age that was 65,000 years older. So we have used more than 600 samples from India, 900 samples from Southeast and East Asian population. Compared with all other population, use the YSTR, use the autosomes, use the mitochondrial DNA, use all the systems that been used and this is uh, some of the techniques that we utilized in our analysis. So first we look to the mitochondrial DNA. In mitochondrial DNA, here you can see that the green color shows the Indian ancestry, the red color shows Southeast Asian ancestry. So Indian Austroasiatic speakers, they are carrying 100% Austroasiatic 100% uh, Indian ancestry, whereas in their Y chromosome, in their paternal ancestry, we see that around 70% of their Y chromosome is associated with the Southeast Asian population. What does it mean? It means their maternal and paternal ancestry, they are showing very distinct population history. Maternal history connects them 100% with India, but paternal ancestry connects them 100%, around 70% with Southeast Asia. So, and we have also ruled out that there is no isolation by distance model which is creating this kind of structure. So as Sir also showed that we do principal component analysis with the autosomes and each and every population usually they align according to their geography. This is very unique for the Indian population. Most of the population living in China, living in Southeast Asia, they usually align based on their linguistic affiliation. But in India, all the population, they align usually based on their geography. For example, if you want to compare Punjabi population with the Kerali, Keralite population or any population living in South, it does not mean that they are speaking different languages, Indo-Aryan or Dravidian language. That's why they are different. They are different because of their, their, their uh, separation in the geography. So here you see that the Austroasiatic people, they are here. This is the Indian client. Most of the Indian population, they are coming in one line but Austroasiatic population are coming in between Southeast Asia and South Asia, more closer, to South, uh, more closer to South Asia. What does it mean? It means that these population, they have most of the ancestry which is present into South Asia and so some of the ancestry which is associated with Southeast Asia. And here you see in this admixture analysis, the, the South Asian population, they are usually divided into two components. Here you can see two colors. But you see the Austroasiatic speakers, they are having around 30% of the ancestry which associate them with the Southeast Asian population. So it means that they have some degree of association with the Southeast Asian population. And we have also used, there is a uh, positive selected loci, positive selected gene in Southeast Asia, which has very uh, unique feature 
and usually the population who migrate from Southeast Asia, they carry this kind of uh, ancestry. Otherwise, in other Indian population, Indo-European, Dravidian population, this kind of ancestry has not been found. And we have also looked the mitochondrial DNA and each and every Austroasiatic population, they don't show very deeply rooted mitochondrial ancestry as well. So with this analysis, we went one step further. We also wanted to calculate what is the time of admixture of these population. So you look this uh, very carefully. This is a admixture plot. Here you see the different color palettes. So these different color palettes, they are showing different kind of ancestries. Here you can see that the South Asian population, they, uh, they have mainly four kind of colors. And these four kind of color like this cyan color or the light blue color, this represent Indus Valley related ancestry. And you can clearly see that among the South Indians, among the North Indians, this ancestry is almost same. Here you see the light green color, this is Andaman related ancestry. This is also present among all the populations. So this is up to you to decide that whether you would like to consider Andaman related ancestry at the first settlers, Indus Valley related ancestry as a first settler, or any other hunting gathering population related ancestry at the first settler, you would find in each and every population of South Asia. So either it is a caste population, it is a tribe population living in any part of the South Asia, they carry this kind of ancestry. So this is up to you to decide who is the ancient settler of India. And we have also compared the uh, IBD segments. These are, these are some kind of DNA segments where we looked at whether we share a longer segment or a shorter segment. So if we are associated closely in our uh, genetic tree, then we share the longer segment. If we are with the, uh, with the longer population history, then we share the shorter segment. And here Austroasiatic population, they share the longer segments with Southeast Asian population, not with Indian population. They share shorter segment with the other South, other the other South Asian population. And the time of admixture, this is very important that the time of admixture of Southeast Asian and Indian ancestry, where Southeast Asian ancestry represent around 29% Indian ancestry, and that is represented by Laos population, and Indian ancestry is around 71%. And the mixture has happened something like 2,200 to 3,700 years back. And we have also studied whether it was a single population which has migrated uh, from Southeast Asia to India. No, it was not a single group. There were multiple groups, but that has been carried in a one haplogroup background that is called haplogroup O2A. And this is also four kind of founders we have identified for the Austroasiatic population who has migrated from Southeast Asia to South Asia. We have also further looked to the modern Indus Valley population. There we have seen that we have seen that the population living even into the, uh, the modern population living around the Indus Valley region, they well represented with the North and South Klein, which is very well represented except two population, the Roars and the Jats. These two population, they show a very clear cut ancestry related with the steppe belt population, but very recent, something like 1500 years back. And we have modeled with the North Indian population, whether the population living in those region, they are associated with the North Indian population, except these two population. Here you see that Roar, they have a lot of pellets, Jard, they have a lot of pellets, Pathan, they have a lot of pellets, but other North Indian population, they have very well defined structure. So we conclude that around 30% Southeast Asian component is present among Munda speakers. And for sure, they are not just one first ancient settler of South Asia who came 65,000 years back. That mixture time of Munda speaker fall between 2000 to 3800 years back. We identified four founders 
these three founders, they were present among the Austro-Asiatic people, but one is very exclusive to Tibeto-Burman. So this is not like a very strong association of a language group with genes. Even Tibeto-Burmans, they carry one of the founding population of the Munda population. And the import of local genes in case of Munda speaker is biased towards female sex because all of their female ancestry is associated with South Asia, but male ancestry associate them with the Southeast Asian population. And the ancient settler gene, it persists in all languages group, each caste, each tribal population, they carry this South Asian ancestry. I would like to acknowledge uh, my parental institute, Institute of Genomics, Tartu Estonia, Professor Willems, Thomas, my supervisor, Might, and other people, CSIR, CCMB, and CDFD, Dr. Thangaraj, his group now, Neeraj, is working as independent. Other people are still working with him. Peter Underhill, Professor George Von Dream, Dr. Rakesh Tamang, and the funding agencies. We applied around 20 grants for the Indian population history. We did not get any. We started working with the COVID. We applied two grants. We got both. So now we are working with the COVID grants. And this is a conference announcement. Uh, we are organizing a very beautiful conference in uh, BHU. We are around 21 speakers. They are coming from outside, TV Sealed and others. Uh, they are ready to come. And this is fully offline. And Dr. Thangaraj is also there. So. If you have time, please do come and enjoy the ancestral information which was connected with all the world population. Thank you very much. <laughs>